How is everybody this morning? Oh, boy. How is everybody this morning? All right. Well, hop up, walk over, meet and greet somebody. You know what to tell them. Tell them the Lord looks good on them this morning. Not everybody at once, though. We don't want no stampede, nobody getting hurt. We got a couple real quick announcements and then we'll get going in worship this morning. Um, men, any men that are interested, we got the Champions for Christ men's conference is coming up this coming weekend. That's in Collinsville, Oklahoma. If anybody else is interested in that, um, please give me a holler. Um, you can do it all on your own, but if you got any questions or you need any help, um, give me a holler if you want to ride with us. A few of us are going. Um, just let me know, but that is Champions for Christ Men's Conference this weekend with Coach Chip Brim and uh, Daryl Strawberry, M MVP baseball player, is going to be there sharing. Him and his wife have given their life to the Lord. I'm telling you what, they are some some strong speakers. I'm excited to hear that. But if you're interested in that, please holler at me. Um, Amanda, can you come and share with us what you got going? Or oh, you got a mic, don't you? All right. Tuesday night at what time did you say? Oh, never mind. We, seven. seven. All right. Tuesday night at seven, young adults, college age group. That is up in our youth room. Thank you guys for heading that on. Um, so Harold, can we go back in the, that flow you was getting into there before, we, before I kind of interrupted it there? You was going somewhere with that. I was feeling it. Let's just stand this morning. We serve a good God, church. Oh, let's just lift up your hands and worship this morning. Let's praise our Savior. You are so worthy, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, we give you the highest praise. The 
There is none like you, Father. Worthy of all our praise. see you high and lifted up. somebody this morning I heard it just a few weeks ago and I come back to it this morning and said Lord I just done that and even there I thought we don't need it I don't need it to open we're already there but it's really only to read this Psalm 24 I'm going to read out the message version it says God claims earth and everything in it God claims world and all who live on it Think about that for just a second. God claims all who live on it. That's you, that's me. God claims us. Do you think anything that God claims as his, that it can be taken away, that it can be stolen? It can be given away if we give ourselves to other than him. But if he lays claims to us like that word says, nothing can take us away from him. Nothing can separate us from God's claim on us. God claims us this morning, church. What are you claiming? What are you claiming? Do you believe you're his? Are you, are you all his and his alone? Are you sharing yourself with the world? It says he built it on ocean's foundations. He laid it out on river, river girders. Who can climb, climb Mount God? Who can scale the holy north face? Only the clean-handed, only the pure-hearted, men who won't cheat, women who won't seduce. God is at their side. With God's help, they can make it. With God's help, we, can, we all know that none of us meet that criteria. None of us are completely clean-handed. None of us are pure-hearted. But with God's help, we can make it, it says. And that's what the cross was for. That is God's help. He gave his only son, Jesus, for us so that we can make it up the holy mountain. This, Jacob, is what happens to God seekers, to God questers. Wake up, you sleepyhead city. Wake up, you sleepyhead people. King glory is ready to enter. Who is the king glory? He is God armed and battle ready. Wake up, you sleepyhead city. Wake up, you sleepyhead people. King glory is ready to enter. Who is the king of glory? It is the God of angel armies. He is king glory. Most verses say lift up your heads. Lift up your heads. That is a sign of boldness. We don't walk around with our head down showing signs that we've been whooped by this world but we lift up our heads to the one and only and that's a boldness that we are in him we are of his he claims me and I will walk in it and when we lift up our heads the king of glory comes through you you are an internal gate you are a doorway that the God's waiting to enter but lift up your head quit looking at your circumstances quit looking at the world look up at what God's done for you Look up to the one who claims you. Lord, have your way in this place this morning. Lord, I know you want to do something this morning. Do it. Do it this morning, Father. Let us step aside. Holy Spirit, come. Have your way in this place. We give it to you now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. are the days 
praise of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And all these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sore. Still we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, and the trumpet dry bones becoming as flesh. These are the days of your servant David rebuilding the temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest. The fields are as white in the world. And we are the neighbors in your vineyard declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds Traffic call and lift your voice It's here to you believe Out of Zion's hill salvation comes Behold he comes Riding on the clouds Shining like the sun At the trumpet call So lift your voice It's here to you believe And out of Zion's hill salvation comes There's no God like Jehovah There's no God like Jehovah there's no God like Jehovah. 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 Behold, He comes riding on the cloud, shining like the sun. Oh, and the trumpet call and lift your voice. It's year of jubilee and out of Zion's hill sounds it again. Oh, behold, He comes riding on the cloud. Shining like the sun at the trumpet call, so lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee, and out of Zion till salvation comes. So lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee, and out of Zion till salvation
Isn't he good? God is so good to us. Even in troublesome times, he is so good. His goodness will always prevail. His goodness will always prevail.
Hallelujah. Jesus, we love you. Hallelujah. Glory to you, Father. Can't you just feel his presence this morning? His peace and his love just flowing in through you and out of you. Hallelujah. Glory to you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what's happening around the world. God is right here and right now. And he's ready to to fill you up with his love and with his wisdom and with his mercy, hallelujah, and his grace overflowing in each and every one of our lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may feel alone in this life. You may feel like nobody cares, but God knows who you are, knows you better than you know yourself, and he loves you, and he's working in your life right now in the name of Jesus. Let's give him thanks. Hallelujah, Father. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord, for working in our lives. Thank you, Father, for being such a good God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for for being Emmanuel, that you're with us. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. All right. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. I was praying the other night, and I just found myself rocking in the spirit. And um, in my spirit, I just started saying, ascribe to the Lord, ascribe to the Lord. And I was thinking of that psalm, you know, where it's, it just goes on, ascribe to the Lord this, and ascribe to the Lord that. And I just flipped open my Bible, and it fell straight open to First Chronicles chapter 16, just after the Ark of the Covenant had been brought to the city, and that famous story of David dancing with all his might and worshiping in the streets. And, um, and it's... And my eyes fell straight to that scripture, ascribed to the Lord. And it got me really excited because I knew that there was, you know, one of those times you're like, there's a gem here. I can't wait to see what the Lord is saying at this time to encourage us. And um, this is what he says. I'm going to start up at verse 23. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering. Come before him. Worship the Lord and the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let the trees of the forest sing. Let them sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. Don't we need a righteous judge right now in the nations? Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Cry out, save us, God our Savior. Gather us and deliver us from the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, amen, and praise the Lord. Amen, amen. Well, there's nothing better than God's word. Amen. Glory to you, Father. All right, I've got a couple of prayer announcements, and then we'll pray over the tithe and offering this morning. So, ushers, why don't you go ahead and come on up. Uh, We want to continue to lift up Linda Peck. She has COVID. Uh, I think she's doing okay right now. Is is that what you've heard? Yeah. So, we would just continue to lift her up and and for healing in her body. And then I have a prayer request for a Doug Smith. That's not doing well. He's home from the hospital, but not doing well. And also, uh, Daryl Mabry, who they just told me is out in the foyer and is having chest pains. They're watching over him. But we want to lift up uh, Daryl Mabry in the name of Jesus. So let's everybody bow our heads and we'll pray over these needs and over the tithe and the offering this morning. Father, we lift you up in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for for what you're doing in our lives. And we ask right now in the name of Jesus that that uh, these prayer needs that we have just spoken, Lord, that you begin to do a healing work in their bodies right now. For Daryl, that you take away his chest pains, hallelujah, that you work in his heart, 
and clear it up and make it whole in the name of Jesus, Father. Hallelujah. And that for Linda and for Doug, Lord, that you do a healing in their body. Father, touch their very lives. For somebody else here that you know of, that you're thinking of, ask, Lord, that you work in their individual lives for healing and wholeness, that your love would begin to, to touch them in a very real way, that their hearts will begin to reach out for you, needing you in their lives, Father. Hallelujah. For those of us that know the Lord and, and have not been serving him faithfully or have not been reading his word or, or thinking about God on a daily basis, I ask, Lord, that you just begin to work in the lives of each and every one of them right now, that their desire, their love, their need, their thirst for the word of God would come in such a a quantity in their lives, Father, that they will reach out for you in the name of Jesus. They will reach for your word. They can't get enough of it. Your word is like uh, water in a dry desert, Father. Hallelujah. We want more of it. And when we get it in our lives, it begins to heal us from the inside out. Hallelujah. Overflowing in our lives to people around us that we can be witnesses and touch them and minister to them very real ways. And Father, I thank you for these needs. I ask you, Lord, that you bless the tithe and the offering this morning. Lift up those that give. I pray that as we uh, continue the service, Lord, that you speak through pastor, that you touch our lives. And we just thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing and all that you're going to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said.
Amen. All right. That was beautiful. Okay, kids, you may be dismissed this morning for class. And let's give our pastor, Jerry Moore, a warm welcome as it comes Amen. up. Amen. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you so much. A few weeks ago, after, well, right after the, we left Afghanistan, I had a, an overwhelming sense and the feeling of hopelessness that started then. And when our administration, and again, this is not a political message, but I'm just telling you, this is what prompted me feeling, having a feeling of hopelessness. And I see Jeremy and Nina back here, and he, he, the landing just burnt over there for him. And so uh, I know that you probably went through a, a sense of, God, what's taking place here? And that's sort of what I took, I, I was feeling in our nation, what in the world is taking place here? And we left so many Americans behind, 500 to 1,000. We don't even know how many people we left behind. And so uh, we left billions of dollars worth, 85 billions of dollars worth of equipment. We could have gotten it out. If we couldn't have gotten it out, you know what we could have done? We could have blown it up. I mean, I don't understand this. This is just beyond my imagination of why that, I mean, and we've got, these are military people that are running our government. So there's something wrong, dreadfully wrong, with what's taking place in our world today. But, you know, this is really a disaster of epic proportion in the making as we see it. And we as a nation, and then again, we go into this vaccine mandates, which I'm, if you're taking a vaccine, that's all well and good. God bless you. But I'm telling you, I'm not taking it. And I'm not, I don't want to be mandated by our government to do something that this is my body and I want to keep it out of it. Amen? So you, it's your choice, but do it. But there is a, a really, this divides our nation between the vaccinated and the non-vaccinated. So let's not let that do this because the Bible says a house divided against itself cannot stand. So let's not, let's not judge anybody. If you've got vaccinated, thank God. But if you didn't, thank God for it. It's your choice. So, um, but a house divided against itself cannot stand. And you, you know what? I know things like this have got to come to pass to fulfill prophecy. I know this has got to take place. But the border traffic, the, the border crisis, the, sex, the child sex trafficking down there on the border, it, that really just grates at my soul. And I become so, God, when is this going to end? And so there's this feeling of hopelessness that just keeps coming. And so, I, and I read further though, um, in the word where it says, Luke 21, 28, he says, whenever you see these things beginning to come to pass, lift up your head because redemption is about to draw nigh. And so all of our redemption, I really believe that the second coming is going gonna, is gonna to take place. But whenever I, I continue to think about the inflation and they're wanting to raise the debt load to, you know, I mean, the uh, budget to 3.5 trillion, folks, we cannot sustain that. This, as a nation, we cannot sustain all that. And so the murder rates are increasing in America, and, and it just continues to rise. And this is alarming to me. And these are characteristics, though, of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And um, I guess the, to tap it all off, the insubordination of General Milley, by all appearances, you know, I think, God, what in the world? This was the, uh, the commander-in-chief of, for, under Trump, and he carried over into Biden. And so the insubordination that he calls China and tells China, listen, if we're going to do an attack, I'm going to call you and let you know it's going to happen. How stupid can you be and still breathe? I mean, something is wrong with that logic. It's just one of those things, but you say, well, Pastor, do you have a right to be hopeless? Yes. But I don't have a reason to be because there is a difference here. <clears throat> We must learn to trust and feed on the Word of God. Martin Luther, one time, his wife came in. He, was, he suffered with a lot of depression, but he, she came in and she says, Honey, I see that you're all depressed. You know, where's your trust? And he said, Honey, I may be depressed, but he says, Feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving, but I'll place my trust in the Word of God because nothing else is worth believing. So this is where we've got, to, we've got to take it to. We've got to get to the Word of God. You know, and again, I was reading Greg Fritz's newsletter this past week, and uh, he said there's one person who went by feelings, and that was Isaac. And whenever Jacob had dressed up like Esau, and he says, it feels like Esau. It feels like Esau. 
but it was really Jacob. And so Jacob deceived him. And Jesus said, this is where I really want to get to here in a second. He said, blessed are they who believe and they have not seen. So we haven't really seen all we want to see, but I'm telling you, it's coming. 2 Corinthians 4.18, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, because the things that are seen, listen carefully, they're temporary. But the things that are not seen are eternal. And you can't see hope, but it's there. Today I'm talking about a quality called hope. Now Romans 8.24 says, hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? And the very definition of faith is faith is the substance of things hoped for. And it's evidence of things not seen. So this is why, but you know, I was reading also a scripture that, that, that hope deferred makes the heart sick. So you can't put off hoping. You've got to somewhere, if you've got a feeling of hopelessness and despair, confusion and chaos in your life, you somewhere have got to tap in to that one quality called hope. The Bible says, and I think it's Hebrews 11, the latter part, it says, now abides these three things, three things that are abiding. Faith, hope, and love. Love's the greatest. Love will never fail, but hope, you've got to have hope. And so um, let's just jump into this. <clears throat> you know, uh, I think that was Obama's theme for his election, hope and change. And it really became mine after he got elected. I hope it changes. But today, uh, I think it, Biden's slogan is make the Taliban great again. I saw that advertised. I mean, isn't that nuts? That's what we're doing. We're arming them, and we're just giving them the opportunity to do this. But I tell you, I've got to get beyond that. And hopelessness, hopelessness comes from whenever you've suffered a loss. And we've suffered a lot of losses in Afghanistan, we've, not only militarily, but lives. But you know, one thing I'm reading about is that the Christians in Afghanistan, they are wanting to convert the Taliban. Wow! Isn't that great? But that's an attitude called hope. I mean, lots of luck on that. I hope they do. But we have got to really develop a sense of hope within ourselves as we face our nation and the crises that are facing our nation. But hope, hopelessness comes when there's, there's been a loss and you've got a lot of anxiety and there's sorrow and grief, worry and frustration. And these characteristics sometimes, over time, they produce a sense of hopelessness. And if we fail to develop hope, despair will set in. So you and I, we've got to guard our hearts against that. Amen? Uh, Jeremiah 31, 10 through 17. Before I get into that, I want you to know that God has got a word for everyone. And so, Father, I'm thanking you right now. As we get into this message, there's going to be a word for everyone here. There's going to be a word for those even that was, in, in, that was carried away into Babylonian captivity. You had a word for those that were going into captivity, but you also had a word for those that were, didn't go into captivity, but they stayed there. So God, I just thank you that you're going to let me speak today and allow me to touch the hearts of people and where they live. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This is a... Um, Jeremiah, did I, what are we on? Jeremiah 30, what did I say? 31.10. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He who scatters Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and has ransomed him from the hand of the stronger than he. Therefore, they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, streaming the goodness of the Lord for wheat and new wine and oil, for the young of the flock and the herd. Their souls shall be well watered again, and they shall sorrow no more at all. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old together. And I will turn their mourning to joy, and, their comfort, and I will comfort them, and I will make them rejoice rather than sorrow. I will satiate the soul of the priest with abundance, and my people will be satisfied with my goodness, says the Lord, and a voice was heard in Ramah. Remember that, that city, Ramah. It's only five miles from the city of peace, Jerusalem. 
It says, but a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentations and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, children, refusing, listen carefully, to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Thus says the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tear, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they will come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope in your future. Say that with me. There is hope in my future. There is hope in my future. Make that proclamation and declaration. There is hope in your future, says the Lord, and your children will come back to its borders. So that's the people who were leaving and it says that, the, that a voice was heard, and it was, it was uh, Rachel re- weeping for her. T- now, Rachel had already lived. So this is just basically the, the women who had lost the, 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 the loved ones, and they were going into the Babylonian captivity. But let me just say this. For the ones that were going into captivity, listen to this. <clears throat> I'll get to that in a minute. Let me just let me continue down my notes here. <clears throat> there is Jeremiah 31, there is hope in your future, says the Lord. And really, that word hope is a cord line that extends to the future back to your present tense. And basically it means to anchor forward and then winch yourself to where you're gonna be with this hope going taking place in your heart. It means to anchor forward and then Looking forward to a better tomorrow. So this is, uh, this is not me telling you. This is God telling you through a message, there is hope in your future. Just keep that in mind. There's hope in my future. Don't let despair and anxiety, doubt, fear and frustration, and don't allow grief to take place in your life. It will, it, it will not help. But... A voice was heard in Rhema. Now, the word Rhema comes from a root word. It means to hurt, to shoot, to delude, to betray, or causing one to fall, to beguiled. It means bitterness also. A voice was heard in Rhema. It's where there was a hurting going on and refused to be comforted. Not that comfort wasn't available, but you and I have got to step up to the plate and say, you know what, God, I don't like what's going on in my nation, but I know that the God of all creation is directing our nation, and he sets up leaders, and he pulls them down. So I'm going to trust in God that he's doing the right thing, amen, and rather than wanting to do what we want done. It also means a high place, an exaltation, an elevation, but refu- Rachel refused, the, the women of Israel refused to be comforted because they knew that that generation was going to be leaving and not coming back. Ramah, as I said, is about five miles from Jerusalem. It's a city of bitterness. It's where chaos and confusion and strife reigns. And that's the hometown of Samuel, the prophet, the city located just on the outskirts of the tribe of Asher, which means happy. So this is where many people, though they, they live their, li- their entire life, they build houses and then they, they live in Ramah. And this is the precise location where Jeremiah parted from the exiles of Jerusalem when they were on their way to the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. This was a location that had a history of causing pain and sorrow and a longing for peace and comfort. And so every one of us, a lot of people here, we build, we live our entire lives looking for something better, which is good. But many people, they go to, they, they live their life in, in, in grief and turmoil. But God wants you to get beyond that and, it's, and, and recognize that hope is found in your future. You know, the, the Bible says, I think it's in, in, in Matthew two, I think it is, but he says, blessed are three, blessed are they who are five. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be, what? Comforted, if they will receive it. But a voice was heard in Ramah, and Rachel, the children, the mothers, would not receive the comfort. They had the ability to do it, but they did chose not to receive the comfort. And that longing for peace, every one of us, I think, has. But now the city of Jerusalem is only about five minutes away if by, by today's modern transportation, The city isn't too far from mourning and bitterness and betrayal, a life that's been diluted and and polluted, a life that's been betrayed or a life cut short, wasted, a nation deceived, as as I think we've been deceived. I think that 
a city of peace, the city of Jerusalem, is just around the corner. Amen? <clears throat> the reason I think that God is using a city as an example of weeping and bitterness and trouble and chaos, confusion, turmoil, contention and strife, many people, they build their house and they raise their family in, a, in an atmosphere of confusion and strife, this raiment. And they never leave this place of grief and sorrow. And they never mature out of mourning and they never grow out of grief. Everybody loses something at some point in time in your life. But you've got to grow out of that grief. And again, and you've got to hope for a better future. And so this is what we're doing today is we want to know how to act and live. If we, You know, some people don't know how to act or live without dealing with some crisis in their life. And everybody's known these people. I've counseled with hundreds of them. That they wouldn't know what to do if they didn't have a crisis. They wouldn't know what to do if they didn't have a problem. Man, try to just take a deep breath and live in peace. There's nothing any better than that, amen? So, <clears throat> excuse me just a minute. I haven't spoken in two weeks, so my voice is a little weak. <clears throat> if we refuse comfort... Hope will dissipate and fade from our future. So you've got to, today, it's a must. You've got to say, you know what? In choosing rather than being in despair and grief and mourning and of the loss, I want to right now believe that God says there's hope in my future, and I want to believe that. Amen? Now, there is a choice and this point of choice, if you fail to accept and receive the comfort, then you continue to live in Ramah. Whenever the city of Jerusalem, the city of peace, is just a few miles away. So today, you can make this transition. You don't have to continue on. And I don't have to continue on in mourning our, the fading of our government, the fading of our nation, the fading of our constitution. I don't have to mourn that. I can say, God, you are the author of this nation. You founded this nation on the grace of God. And you gotta, I got to recognize, and this is me, but I'm just telling you, my, you may not feel this way. And if you don't feel this way, you probably haven't been watching any news. Because you got to recognize we are in a crisis right now. Communism and socialism is about to take over our nation, and we've got to do something. And my prayer is, God, show me what to do. I don't know what to do. And so many of us, we, and, and we can pray. We can pray. And so this is why that uh, I, I just want you to know that, you know, the, as a matter of fact, the people that were carried away into Babylonian captivity, you know what God said to them? He said the place, he says, build houses and, and inhabit them. Plant vineyards and, and eat of the, of the vineyard that you planted. He says, go ahead and you're in captivity, but do this. And, and then marry and have children and let there be an increase in your. And then he also said, he said, pray for the peace of the city that you're in. Because in that, when, whenever I bring peace to that city, he says, you will be at peace. Now, these were the people that were carried away into captivity, and they were trying to, to recognize, what am I going to do if I'm carried away? Now, other people are carried away into captivity, but the ones that lost their family into the Babylonian captivity, he says, you know, there's hope in your future. So God is always a God of hope. He's encouraging you, and he's encouraging me to, and all, our nation that we can see a better nation, and we can have a better nation in the future. Amen? <clears throat> So the solution is within our reach. Hope and comfort is within our grasp. And the panic and the emotions of the great when you once yielded. You know, whenever I remember um, floating down a river with a group of men. And one guy lost his tube and he began to panic. So I, I got my tube and threw it over there to him. And I said, get a hold of the tube. And he was just fighting the water. He, sometimes when you're in a panic mode, you're just fighting the water. Whenever this, all you got to do is get a hold or else relax. And, I'm, and, and I had to practice the same thing. I had to just, hey, God, what am I going to do here? I don't have a tube. So I just had to relax and float down the river until I found. And then I'm I was hollering at these guys to wait on me. They couldn't hear me. And so, so I had to swim for the most of the part all the way back down the river. But sometimes when you're trying to get a hold and you're, you're panicking so much, you can't get a hold of anything. You can't hope 
It's just around the door. Recognize, folks, you, your life is not over until God is finished with it. Did you all see this on Facebook? They had this, this stunt pilot. He was flying his plane, and man, he was making all these turns, and one of the wings came off. And the title says, you're not going to die before your time, because the stunt pilot, he wrestled this plane back to the ground. And it looked like he's going to crash, and then he just, suddenly, he just came right in on a smooth landing. I just find that so amazing. Your life is not over until God says it's over. And there is hope in your future. I, um, I read this poem about Malchus. It's an illustration, and I'm going to insert it here. It's got one bad word in it. It's called hell. You don't want to go there. But he says, I knew a Malchus once, severely wounded by Peter's sword. Crazed by anger and dazed by pain, he thrust aside with awful pride that gentle hand whose touch could make him whole again. Have Jesus touched me? Hell, he hissed. I, it was his disciple swung the sword aiming at my neck and missed. I want no part of Peter's Lord. But he did receive Peter, uh, Jesus did stick the ear back on that Peter had cut off. Strong, and here's the conclusion. Strong Savior Christ so oft repelled for rash disciples blamed. Poor wounded fools by pride compelled, they go on living maimed. How many times do we allow the injury or the pain or the sorrow or the grief or the mourning? How, many, how long do we allow that? Many times we allow that to take place to come in and take the place of where God wants to put comfort and he wants to put hope into our lives. It happens so many times. But Malchus, that was just one uh, example of how, that, uh, how Malchus, he did receive the healing touch of Jesus. But it could have happened the other way. Isaiah 41 through 5, let's read. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says the Lord of God. Lord your God, speak comfort to Jerusalem. Say to her, the war is over. Your iniquity is purged. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. Now, this was a prophetic utterance that was being fulfilled in Matthew 3. It says, the voice of comfort is one, John the Baptist, the voice of comfort is one who cries, prepare in the wilderness, make Weigh the Lord, make straight and smooth paths in the desert, a highway for our God. God wants you to live in peace. He doesn't want your life to be like a roller coaster up and down. He wants you to be, you got a smooth path before, path before you. This is how he wants it. But so many of us, we get so caught up in this roller coaster ride of crisis from crisis to crisis. And we live in the city of Ramah. We've got to get out of that city and recognize God's got hope in our future. And he wants you to know you need to get to the city of peace and you need to and really, really abide in that peace. And this is why he says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I did a message not, well, it's been years ago, but I was speaking about peace. And the, the Lord just spoke to my heart and he says, my peace is like a gyroscope. Now, folks, quite frankly, I had an idea what a gyroscope was, but I didn't know what it did. So I looked it up. I went and looked up the gyroscope, and basically it's in, it's in ships, it's in planes, it's in a lot of things, but it basically keeps the ship steady even though you've got waves beating against it. It's a gyroscope. It just keeps you on course whenever the wind is trying to drive you off course. And he says, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. And what did Jesus, as soon as the, as the crucifixion was over with and the resurrection had occurred, and Jesus appears to his disciples, what is the first thing he said? Peace be to you. Because they were so traumatized by the crucifixion of watching their Messiah, watching their healer, the loved one, die. The one who worked miracles, why couldn't he save himself? But they were so traumatized by this that they had to recognize that he's there and he's speaking peace. There's been, on the outside, there's been turmoil and chaos and confusion. There's been my crucifixion, but I'm alive now and I'm here and you have hope. And that's the hope that we have in the resurrection. So the preparation, though, listen carefully, 
is the decision we make to receive the God of all comfort. He refers to himself, I'm the God of all comfort. He wants to come in and comfort your heart. He wants to massage it. He wants to, to just put, put, there is a balm in Gilead and put that oil and that ointment and that healing salve around your heart. He wants to heal that. He doesn't want you to go through life being drugged from pillar to post by from crisis to crisis, from, from one hurt to another hurt. God says, I want you to know I'm the God of all comfort and I want to bring hope to your life even today. Amen? Verse 4 says, every valley will be lifted up and filled up. Your low places will be filled with encouragement. Every mountain and high place will be made low. The crooked and the unseen will be made straight and level. You know what I like about this highway that he's talking about here? It's a highway of holiness. And, And I really, I've always, I love to preach about this. But even though a fool gets on the highway... There's no exit ramp. He can't get off. I find that so amazing. He said, well, Pastor, can we backslide if you want to? But why in the devil would you want to? I mean, why would you want to walk away from the Prince of Peace, the God of all comfort? Who would want to do that? If you're doing that, you're probably like our Congress. You're out of your mind. So you got to recognize God is wanting to bring comfort to your life. The rough places will be made a plain. And then in verse 5, it says, The glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed in your life and all flesh, and everyone will see it. And it says, The mouth, it's not me telling you this, the mouth of the Lord has spoken it, and God is bringing us comfort. All you got to do is receive it. I receive it. So how do I do that? You do it by faith. Remember, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. In Isaiah 40, 27, he says, comfort to the weak. He says, those who have no strength, I will, I will strengthen them. And they will go from strength to strength. They will go from faith to faith. They will go from hope to hope. God wants you, to, you don't have to be living in despair and mourning all your life. There is a new day dawning. And it's the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's it's just around the corner, congregation. I really believe this with my whole heart. The mouth of the Lord has spoken, and so he wants to bring us comfort. So here's the question. How How do we need to keep the hope alive? And it's through comforting one another. 2 Corinthians 4 I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 1, 1 through 4, it says, Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God, listen carefully, of all comfort. The God of all comfort. In verse 4 it says, Who comforts us in all of our tribulations, the purpose that we might be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. So it's not about you. It's about you helping other people because you'll know you've been comforted by God. So you can help other people who are going through the same test and trial or the same loss. You can help, you can comfort them. We will comfort others with the comfort with which we ourselves were comforted. So we pass it on, we play it forward. Comfort one another. How do I or how should I or how can I comfort one another? How do we do that? And keep in mind, prophecy, what's the reason for prophecy? In 1 Corinthians 14, 3, it says, He who prophesies speaks three things, edification, exhortation, and comfort. You need to learn how to prophesy not only to yourself, but to your family, as well as to other people. Thus says the Lord, prophesy is for, it's more than just foretelling the future, but it's bringing the future, it's bringing hope to your, to your right now so that you can have a better, a more preferable tomorrow. God wants to do that in your life. And, he, you know, he says, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but he says, more than that, even though I wish you all prophesied. Why? And you prophesy. The Bible says, let us prophesy. He said, who can prophesy? Everybody can prophesy. Do it in proportion to your faith. Prophesy to yourself. I did this this morning. I was prophesying to myself. There's a brighter day coming in our government. 
And I'm not talking about the Republicans coming back to power. I'm talking about God's kingdom being established in our government because the government will be on his shoulder and it's going to be our kingdom that's going to be established. The kingdom of God, I should say, but we're a part of it. The kingdom of God is what? It's righteousness and it's peace and it's joy in the Holy Ghost. So this is why you and I, we've got to recognize the kingdom of God needs to come in our lives. And this is, I pray every day, <coughs> excuse me, I pray every day that the kingdom of God would come and the will of God be done. Listen carefully for all of you, as well as all of my family. I want the kingdom to come and the will of God to be done. Amen? Discouragement is where there is no hope for tomorrow. As a matter of fact, your tomorrows are cast away. They've been wasted. Because, God, I don't have, I, it's not going to be any better tomorrow than it is today. From the looks of our government, it doesn't look that way. But I'm just telling you right now, I'm prophesying to our government right now. Peace and righteousness is coming to our government. We are going to see a change in our government. We're going to see, and it's not going to be for the bad. It's, I'm speaking right now in Jesus' name. It's going to be for the good. And there's going to be hope for everybody. There is hope for your tomorrow. So you speak comfort, and whenever you do this, when you're speaking comfort, listen carefully. Do it kindly. Speak kindly to one another. Kindness from the heart speaks to the inner man. This is the very room that discouragement wants to take up residence, and he wants to set up furniture, and discouragement wants to reside in the inner man. But this is where if you speak kindly to one another, folks, kindness goes a long way. It goes a long way in a lot of different, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. The inner man affects the understanding, the thinking, and the consciousness, and the memory of past events. And this is one way that you can comfort yourself, is if God brought you through a trial or a tribulation or a test before, he will do it again. He loves you. Whenever I get to feeling, as I was a couple of weeks ago here, of hopelessness, I got to think, God, you have brought me so th through so many things. You brought me through the fire. And when God, when you, when you, whenever you're going through hell, don't stop. Just keep going. There's another side. So this is why that God wants you to know, yes, every one of us will go through testings and trials and temptations and tribulations. You'll go through a loss. Every person in here has lost someone or something. No kidding. So every one of us, you've got to learn how to deal with that loss. And again, you have to have the ability to receive the comfort that God wants to give to you. And we do this by speaking kindly. Memories, let me just deal with that for a second, are influenced by little experiences. You know, I, I, I've been a, I smelt perfume on a, on, on a lady that brought back a memory. And my wife used the same perfume. And I said, what is that? I couldn't remember what the name of it was. What is that? I'm going to get her some more. I really like it. So, I, so memories, little things like a smelling of perfume or even like a, someone cooking a good meal. You know, fry, you know my mom used to fr uh, cook beans and fry potatoes and onions. And, you know, that smell, every time I walk into the house and Linda's cooking that, I, I think my mind goes back to the my memory of the past. And so, but if you add all the memories of the past to a good memory, if you add the, to those good memories, you add condemnation and guilt to the experiences plus time, then the negative feelings of hopelessness will come back into your life. One example of that, I remember the earliest memory that I have of a child, I was probably, I'm thinking four or five years old. My mom and dad got into a big argument, and I was laying in bed, and I saw an egg come flying through and hit the wall. She threw an egg at my father. Then I heard a skillet come through there. She threw the skillet. And uh, she had a little temper. She really did. Thank God I didn't get it. <laughs> 
at any rate, those, this is how memories can affect your life, even negative memories. You remember the Genesis 50, 21, 20 to 21, the Amplified Version says, the memories of Joseph should have been the same as the brothers who sold him into slavery. But his memory was not the same. Because after he had, they were sold into slavery, they, they went to him and said, you know, Jacob, your father, he said, treat us kindly. Because they knew that after Jacob had died, that they could be in severe trouble because they sold him into slavery. But you know, um, I like Joseph's response in Genesis 50, 20. As I remember, as for me, you guys thought it was all evil against me. You thought it was, you did it for evil. Now look at this. But God meant it for good to bring about the keeping of many people alive. So again, intentions are important, but on the other hand, you got to recognize that many times God directs intentions. Because had they never agreed to kill, jo uh, to throw Joseph into the pit, the coat of him in many colors, and, and try to tell his father, that Jacob, that, that, you know, that some animal had eaten him. But yet there's a, a, a band of uh, Ishmaelites going down to Egypt got him out of the pit, so they sold him into slavery. So his brother's memories, though, um, whenever they said, you know, your dad said, be, be kind to us, Joseph, the Bible says, was touched with their repentance of the evil toward him. And Joseph said in, in, in 50, Genesis 50, 21, he said, do not be afraid. I'll provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them. He comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Wow. He could have said, don't be afraid. Man, I'm sure they'd all just paid attention. But the Bible says, you know, he comforted them. It's going to be all right. I'll take care of you. I'll take care of your kids. We'll make sure that we'll do that. We're in this thing together. And he spoke kindly to them. I'm going to close with this thought right here. One closing. But several points. <laughs> you know, there's seven different appearances of God's abiding presence in the Bible that's listed. First one was with Adam, when God walked with Adam in the cool of the day. And they had communion, they had a wonderful time, and everything was at peace. And you know how, how that it was just really... Everything was in harmony. It was in synchronization with, with life itself because they were in the Garden of Eden. But then after, you know, after the fall, well, let me just, I, you know the story, so I'm not going to go into that. Then there was with Noah. The Bible says Noah walked with God. Moses, he encountered God through the ark, not only on the Mount Sinai, but he also included, he said, build me an ark of the covenant, and this is where my presence is going to abide on the inside of that ark. And this is where we had Aaron's rod that budded, and you had the manna, and you had something else, I thought. Anyhow, it was, that's where God's presence. And wherever that ark went, that's where the presence of God, that's where we're to follow. And by the way, this is where every one of us need to be living day by day, following the presence of God. And don't go there if God doesn't lead you. So, and then there was... Enoch is really, and then the time of Solomon's temple and time of Herod's temple, and then at the time of Jesus Christ. He says, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I only do what I hear the Father saying, and I only, uh, I only speak what I hear the Father saying, and I only do what I see the Father doing. So there was this oneness, the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, when he was baptized, the Spirit descended from heaven, and out of the heaven came, this is a voice, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. But the last time the abiding presence of God has appeared on earth to console and give comfort and give hope is, are you ready? Colossians 1, 26 and 27. 26 says, the mystery has been hidden from the ages. This mystery that I'm talking about right now where God's abiding presence is getting ready to descend somewhere 
He said, it's been hidden from the ages, but now it's been revealed to the saints. God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery, which is, listen, listen carefully now, Christ in you. The what? The hope of glory. The hope of a better day. The hope of a better tomorrow. The hope of a better future. The hope of our nation. The hope of your families. That they won't get off track. And this is why I just pray that every family in here and your offspring, that you would be steadfast, abiding in this presence, recognize that Christ is in me. Most people think he's way out there in the heavenly place, and sometimes you gotta, you got to cry out, and it feels like you, you know where it can be found. Folks, he's not way out there. He's way in here. He's the inner recesses of your heart. Christ is in you, and that within itself is the hope of glory. You say, well, what's the hope of glory? It's the hope of, of things better to come. There's ever expanding, ever increasing, ever enlarging in your life. As a matter of fact, it means to also represent better than the facts warrant. So you may be doing some things that you shouldn't be, but I want you to know the glory of God is going to represent to the God the Father better than the facts warrant. This is where we are. Romans, I close with this. Did I say I was closing, right? Okay, I'm trying to. <clears throat> Romans 8, 19 through 25. Just, just listen. This is the word of God. Listen to this. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. That's us. It's, the creation itself is groaning for us to be revealed to creation, but not only to creation, but to our the other inhabitants that are in the earth. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who separated, who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be li- delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. There's hope in your future. For we know that the whole earth groans and labors with birth pains until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Just around the corner. For we are saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance or with endurance. You just got to keep hoping. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for us. I still grapple with this one thing. That the Holy Spirit who's been given to us, that I pray in tongues a lot, but I want you to know this. He is my helper. He is my comforter. He is my paraclete, another of the same kind, just like Jesus, living on the inside of me. And that is my hope of glory. Wow. You know, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts. This is God speaking. I know the thoughts that I think toward you. They are good and not evil. They are thoughts of peace to give you a future and to give you a hope or to give you the future you hope for. But if you have no hope, hope, it's been deferred, it's been put off, and it's been dissipated, and you have no hope, then you have no future. But God says, basically, I want to give you the future that you're hoping for. So where is your hope for your future? Some of you, you're trying to get the kids raised. Some of you are trying to find a better job. Some of you are trying to just find a better relationship. You know, hope, develop the one you're in. Develop the relationship you're in and learn how to cultivate and work and move forward in hope. For I want to give you a future and a hope. I'm trying to close. Three things I'll close with right here. Here it is. And this is, this is all good. 
Even the closings are good, aren't they? God is with us. God is for us. And if God be for us, who can be against us? But more importantly, God is in us. This is where the abiding tabernacle of the Holy Spirit right now, this is where the abiding presence of God wants to live inside your life so that whenever you're up against the circumstances and you're up, Jeremy, you're up there watching the landing burn. You've still got hope. There's a future out there. I, the devil may have meant it for evil, but God says, I'm intending this for good. So congregation, it is really up to you. If you're living in Ramah, get out of the city of Ramah. If you're living in Ramah and you refuse to be comforted, accept the comfort that's available. This message is a comfort. God was speaking. Hope in your, there is hope in your future. God said that, not me. I just repeated it. I'm just the messenger. So this is why you've got to recognize God is in your future. Amen. Did you get anything out of that? Um, go ahead and shut the cameras off right now for a second. And uh, Carol, would you come up here? Carol's got a, a word for us that, that she's been through. She's been the test.